welcome to this podcast series on pseudoscience, fake news, and how to fight back, supported by a grant from the Open Society Foundation and in partnership with the Challenging Pseudoscience Group at the Royal Institution of Great Britain. My name is Robert Pyra. Together with my colleague, Professor Marius Turda, we're inviting you to join a conversation about the meaning of history and the role of science in today's society. Our subject in this series is how history and science have become weaponized to support political agendas in East Central Europe, particularly during the last few years. This is intended as a lively and urgent contribution to the understanding of pseudoscience and the uses and abuses of history in the era of so-called fake news. My guest today is Jean-Paul Himka, Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Alberta, Canada. His prize-winning research has focused on the history of Ukraine, including aspects such as socialism, church history, and the Ukrainian national movement. More recent work has focused on the history of the Holocaust in that country, but also beyond, including a 2013 co-edited volume called Bringing the Dark Past to Light, the reception of the Holocaust in post-communist Europe. This year sees the publication of his much-awaited work, Ukrainian Nationalists and the Holocaust, Oun and Upa's participation in the destruction of Ukrainian Jewry, 1941 to 1944. And for those listeners or viewers not familiar with the terminology, Oun, written O-U-N in English, stands for the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, while UPA, written UPA, for its armed force, the Ukrainian Insurgent Army. It's fair to say that this topic remains controversial in Ukraine, potentially acting as a lightning rod for discussions about national identity and the presence of the past in a country that only gained full independence as late as 1991, and as most in the West know, remains defined by complex geopolitics. We're therefore delighted to welcome an expert, Jean-Paul, to this series. Thank you. Before we begin, I'd like to start by asking you about today's political context in Ukraine and how this has shaped the treatment of history by the state and its organs, for example, through official educational channels, and why in this context, in particular, the Holocaust could attract particular controversy. Okay. I, there are a lot of people who claim that they understand Ukrainian politics, and I have never made that claim. It's a very opaque political society there. So for example, we we know that supposedly mortal enemies were Petro Poroshenko, who was the previous president of Ukraine, and Viktor Medvedchuk, who was supposed to be a pro-Russian. Uh, in fact, he's now charged with state treason. Turns out that those two were in regular regular correspondence, uh, regular interaction, because Ukraine is run in a different way than many other countries, which is that there are some very powerful businessmen with huge corporate interests who run the country among themselves. And, and it's very difficult to get a handle on what's happening. But there have been times when politics of history, memory politics, have played important roles for these politicians. So, and I don't think that these are necessarily issues that these politicians believe in, although, of course, they don't not believe in them, if you know what I mean. Mm. They, they don't, for them, these are just instruments. So it started with Viktor Yushchenko, I would say, who was the president of Ukraine after the Orange Revolution, 2004 and then 2008 when he lost and then 2010 he left office but he was the one who started it off by giving posthumous awards hero of ukraine to various leaders of the organization of ukrainian nationalists and to the uh, various leaders of the ukrainian insurgent army in spite of their historical record and he was the first to promote the career of the person they call Ukraine's memory czar or memory commissar, uh, Volodymyr Vyatrovich, who enjoyed, came to prominence right after the uh, Orange Revolution in the later term also of Yushchenko. Then Yushchenko was 
roundly defeated in the next presidential election. Yushchenko had also been responsible for promoting the famine of 1932-33, the Holodomor, as a genocide, and of collecting thousands and thousands of testimonies, even though the, the people could remember it were very aged or they were their children. And a general victimization narrative of Ukrainian society. But he was roundly defeated. And the next president, Viktor Yanukovych, drew back on this issue. He was not a supporter of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. He stripped some of the leaders of their posthumous awards as hero of Ukraine. He continued to uh, honor the victims of the famine, but kind of moved away from that genocidal portrayal of it, which had existed earlier. Then, as you know, he was overthrown, uh, not voted out, but overthrown in 2014 during the Euromaidan and came to power a much more nationalistic oriented government, even more than that of Yushchenko. And that would have been the government, particularly Petro Poroshenko, when he Again, a very, very rich businessman, owner of media, owner of chocolates, owner, owner of many things. He's got fingers in many pies. And he played that card as well, the nationalist card. He took Vyatrovich, the memory commissar, and put him in charge of the Ukrainian Institute of National Remembrance. And he began a major campaign to so-called decommunized, but really what it was, was the promotion of the glorification of the nationalists. So he had many streets named after them. He um, you know, encouraged the naming of neighborhoods, schools, et cetera, after the leaders of the nationalists. And Poroshenko in his presidential campaign in 2019 had used as his slogan, Vira Mova Armia, the faith, the language, the army. And this was, it might not seem like a nationalist program, but the faith was the introduction of a new Orthodox church in Ukraine and the attempt to diminish the influence of the Ukrainian Orthodox church under the jurisdiction of the Moscow Patriarchate. Language referred to making Ukrainian more and more exclusively the language of administration and of education. So under his leadership, for instance, Hungary was complaining about the removal of Hungarian education in the districts compactly uh, headed by uh, Hungarians. And the army was, of course, we're in a war with Russia and its uh, hirelings, and therefore we need these kind of nationalist moments. And under his presidency, various paramilitary organizations connected with not only the nationalist heritage, but also the neo-fascist, neo-Nazi heritage, which is really a European, pan-European phenomenon. Uh, those people flourish, they form new organizations, uh, they help the police in various neighborhoods by breaking up camps of Roma and so forth. So that's the kind of politics. I feel that much of this is instrumental. There are regional differences in Ukraine. Ukraine is as divided as America. That's why you have one election where a nationalist wins and then where a pro-Russian candidate wins and then another nationalist, Poroshenko. And then now in 2019, President Zelensky won. And his whole program was anti-corruption, don't let businessmen run our country. Unfortunately, he had no political experience, so there's a, you know, a lot of questions about the competence of this government. Thank you, Professor. That's an extremely useful and broad outline of the Ukrainian political scene since independence, but also of the landscape of memory politics within that context, how it has waxed and waned between regimes, but how, with one exception, history is nevertheless been a kind of constant, remaining a tool for those in power. You mentioned various strands here, including the famine, the Holodomor. But given your research focused on the Holocaust, I wondered whether you might say a little more specifically about this, 
and how it could serve, as I mentioned in the introduction, as a lightning rod for these various discussions around the nation and national history. We've certainly seen this to be the case in other countries in East Central Europe, but I wondered if you could tell us a little more about its discursive status in Ukraine in particular. Is it a narrative that, given the country's divided politics, could paradoxically even be a kind of unifying discourse? Oh, no, I don't think you could ever unify the country. Problem is that the uh, Holocaust in Ukraine was particularly effective. So those parts of Ukraine which were longer under German occupation, and you know, Ukraine, parts of Ukraine are conquered right there at the end of June, early July. And they stay under Nazi rule until they're knocked out in July of 1944. So, and the attack by the Germans on the Soviets was a complete surprise. It was an invasion. And those Jews who were on those Western territories were not evacuated. And as a result, uh, a great many Jews were murdered. And then there was, as you move eastward, they're still murdering large numbers. I mean, in Babinyar, at the end of September, over 33,000 Jews are murdered by the Germans. But the Soviets are now quite aware that they should be evacuating more and more of the Jewish population because they're seeing that the Germans are killing them in mass and like unprecedented numbers. And in that process, many Ukrainians took part in the Holocaust. And this at various levels. So the nationalists were cooperating with the Germans right at the beginning in the anti-Jewish violence of 1941. Then there were the police and civil administration structures, were, which were important for the complete, well, almost complete, the intended complete liquidation of Ukrainian Jews, the systematic elimination of all ghettos and Jewish populations. And in Ukraine, very few people were sent to death camps. Only really from Eastern Galicia were people sent to the death camp at Belzec. Belzec people call it in English. But normally the murders were done locally in ravines or they would force Jews to dig their graves. In these entire processes, on almost every step of the way, the Germans had to rely on the local population, which they did everywhere in Europe. Just that in Ukraine, you had a very large Jewish population. One quarter of all Holocaust victims were killed on the territory of today's Ukraine. 1.5 million people. So where did the Germans find out where the uh, Jews were? Well, the local people knew, the civil administration knew, they, were, they gave in the metric books, that is the registers of births, marriage, et cetera, of the Jewish community. They were able to prepare lists. They helped in the formation of the ghettos because the Germans didn't know the towns of Ukraine intimately, but the local people did. And they would say, well, the Jewish neighborhood is here. The least amount of movement could be done by putting the Jews ghetto here. And civil administrations used Jewish forced labor all the time, as long as the Jews were alive. They took Jewish property. When the Germans were killing all these people in ravines or just outside the villages and towns, uh, they needed people to cook for them. They needed people to sometimes guard Jews in barns to take care of uh, them while they were, you know, going to shoot them the next morning. They needed people to help tramp down the uh, graves. It's not that all these people were interested in killing Jews, but the machinery just sucked in all these people. And as I say, the nationalists were at every step of the way involved. And mm. so that's the political moment there. Yeah, but this is in a sense where my question comes from, because, OK, admittedly, Ukraine isn't uniformly nationalist in, in the way that we understand it, perhaps in other countries. However, the fact that this is an episode that, as per Omar Bartos' book, for example, erased, 
this has been largely erased, I think I'm right in saying, from the national canon. It's not something talked about, in a sense, is paradoxically unifying because it's something that the nation does not want to perhaps, like reading between the lines of what you're saying, address. That was, I suppose, what, where I was going with that question. And I, and I don't mean to put words in your mouth. It's more of a provocation. I never thought of it that way, but nobody is particularly interested in reviving this history except perhaps... Well, people in Canada are interested now in uh, discovering the history of what happened to the indigenous people. A lot of Americans are very interested in uh, coming to terms with slavery and the Jim Crow laws. Uh, people in Britain are also interested in looking at that imperial past. You know, Germany looks, you know, this is, there are people who say, hold it. You know, and those, the people of that kind in Ukraine are growing. Right. Uh, yeah. They're the they're and they're the same, they're exactly the same demographic as all the progressive forces in the three countries I mentioned. They're younger, they're more educated, you know. And do you uh, think I mean that there could be perhaps as well a correlation between a kind of social memory and post memory here this is post post memory perhaps you know people who maybe don't even have grandparents that lived through this so it's beyond a generation with direct experience of the second world war so it's distant enough in time not to feel personally responsible or personally defensive about a historical narrative this is a process perhaps that may accelerate what you're talking about well, I would say that that's not entirely the case yet. If you go to a, a village in Ukraine, I've seen this again and again. Like, and Patrick Debois, the French priest who's going through Ukraine talking to people, kids will show you where the Jews were murdered. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw the wonderful film, uh, Mesa Rodzenia, Birthplace by uh, Paweł Wozinski, a Polish director. Mm -hmm. But uh, he goes and visits. Uh, Henry Greenspan goes back to visit where his father was killed, but he can't. He doesn't know where the grave is. Well, after prodding and prodding and prodding, the children take the children take him to a grave of a man who was killed like sixty or some years ago. Mm -hmm. these, there's there's living memory in these places because it was all done right nearby. And, you know, people went like everywhere else looking for that Jewish gold and it might be buried. And so it's not a it's not exactly a happy memory. Plus, you have to understand mm -hmm. that Ukrainians, particularly in Western Ukraine, benefited. Actually, everybody. This is going to sound terrible, but there's a lot of uh, material uh, benefit from the Holocaust among the population and for the country. So Lviv today, the capital of Western Ukraine, is a largely Ukrainian city. At one point, it was a largely Polish and Jewish city. Well, that would be till 1939. And in 1945, it became a largely Ukrainian city. But that's true of so many places, so much social advancement. All the apartments that were abandoned and redistributed of the Jews, all their household items, jewelry, gold, etc. People benefited. So, you know, and I don't think that this is not peculiar to Ukraine. It's also the same yeah. case, you know, the things like that in Poland, any place where there was this kind of intensity of the Holocaust. And it's a topic that a lot of people are uncomfortable with. There are some Jewish scholars who supposedly are doing Holocaust history, and they are really doing Holocaust history. But the one topic they don't want to touch is the uh, role of Ukrainian nationalists. They feel, I'm not exactly sure what they feel, but they tell me that they have to respect the feelings of their Ukrainian colleagues. Would you say that because you're in Canada, it gives you this ability to comment on and research these topics you have a certain geographical distance from them and it gives you a kind of license and a kind of distance that maybe ukrainian scholars feel they lack this is a huge no, generalization I, of course but i i don't feel that my being in canada is a particular advantage there are holocaust scholars in ukraine right now who are just uh, super young people so you can go on the internet and there's just a, just recently, just 
Yesterday, <laughs> I talked by Marta Havrishko on the 80th anniversary of the Lviv Pogrom, where she talked about women as victims and perpetrators and everything else during the anti-Jewish violence of 1941 in Eastern Ukraine. It's just fantastic. My, my wife mm. says she was, was impressed because we watched a lot of those. There's and, a lot of great uh, research coming out of Lviv in particular, I've noticed in recent years. Yes, um, but very it's good not, young scholars. There's uh, yeah, mm. but it's all over. Another real leading light is Yuri Radchenko in Kharkiv, Kharkov in Russian. Uh, mm. Zaporizhia has a very strong group of uh, young scholars working on the Holocaust. So these kind of they're all you know none of them has hit forty. <laughs> mm. A lot of them are in their twenties, but so. So their advantage, and there's a whole bunch I could actually name, or maybe not a whole bunch, but I know their names. They mm-hmm. sit there, they got local archives, they've got personal connections. I go to Ukraine, they know me as kind of a shit stirrer, so they don't want to give me anything. Mm-hmm. So I don't even bother. I mean, I go to Ukraine because I love Ukraine. I mean, it's a place I have lots of friends and lots of relatives, so I go there. But uh, no, I don't think it's an advantage. And in fact, I'll tell you, in Ukraine, I have more of an audience and uh, more followers than I would in Canada or the United States, which is dominated by a kind of nationalist diaspora. Right. So I wanted to ask you then, Professor, because what you sketched is extremely interesting. And we should, I suppose, at some point connect this back to the kind of political framework of this podcast and how history is being used and abused. But we're talking about almost a grassroots development here, I think, of younger scholars coming up through inside Ukraine, questioning their own history, bringing subjects that are perhaps painful, even traumatic, perhaps both sides or all sides, uh, not just perhaps the Jewish side, but also for the Ukrainians as well, into mainstream scholarly discussion. However, what it doesn't seem to have done from what you're saying is percolated the political consciousness yet. So I was just wondering if you could comment on this. How do you see Ukraine's political direction at the moment? We talk in this podcast series a lot about this kind of illiberal drift and how history, the the abuse of history, in fact, reinforces an illiberal tendency in politics. It's used to either silence dissenting voices or perhaps create a monolithic narrative of history that not everybody subscribes to or is not critical. What you're describing is potentially a kind of grassroots challenge from within academia. I wondered wondered if you could comment on the kind of political ramifications of this phenomenon. Okay, I will. I just want to say that all these scholars benefit a lot from support from Western institutions like the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, or Asian institutions like Yad Vashem in Israel, or in the Middle mm-hmm. Eastern, you know, so without that, they would be crushed. But will it percolate up? I think that if you look at the current president, the current president was the first in a long time to not campaign on some kind of national grounds neither pro-Russian nor pro-nationalist, but on an anti-corruption, anti-oligarch campaign. And he won in every oblast of Ukraine except for the Lviv oblast, the heartland of the kind of nationalist uh, feelings. And I think that there are a lot of people who don't want to be involved in this kind of nationalist politics and they they, you know and to my mind i've argued for a long time that what ukraine needs is to have politicians who campaign on the basis of issues like health care equalization of the population you know more equality given the the terrible uh well uh, ukraine actually is more equal than america or canada but that there are issues, independent judiciary, there's a whole bunch of issues that are important. It's not really important I, whether the statue is to this man or that man or that woman. Uh, that's a lesser issue, I think. But it's one that gets votes. Right. It's yeah. interesting because what we're seeing in this series so far, sorry to just interject, quite often this theme, naturally, as you'd expect, of civil society comes up. 
the subtitle of the podcast is And How to Fight Back. And that seems to be an obvious response to these issues. I mean, as you rightly say, there are many other questions besides history. But if history is kind of causing a blockage, if it's still something that is either taboo in the case of the Holocaust or is instrumentalized negatively, then it does start perhaps to form blockages for civil society to engage with openly. So I just wondered in this context whether you saw this is a potential remedy as well, civil society being conscious of, yes, history, but then also all these other areas that you talk about, equal rights for all sorts of minorities, perhaps not just national minorities. Yes. You know, there are certain NGOs which are more liberal than others. You know, we're partially right now being sponsored by Open Society, yes? Yeah. And I have taken part over the years in summer school projects also funded by the Open Society. And I get the young young people and I explain various things about how to do history, not just the Holocaust, because I've been a historian for a long time. These things, people like George Soros or Harold Binder in Austria, who funds the Center for Urban History of East Central Europe in Lviv, these have, been, these have been crucial people creating these kind of NGOs. If they were in Putin's Russia or Lukashenko's Belarus, or for that matter, in my province of Alberta, foreign money coming and trying to influence ideas, it can be a real no-no. But I think that um, times are changing and Ukrainians are ever more sophisticated you know, they've emerged from communism in late 1980s. They were not accepted or even courted for the EU, for the European Union. While a real disaster case like Romania was, which I, I can't believe, you know, I can understand that it happened. But, it, you know, so it is really slowly coming into its own. The view has discovered you know, there's a city with a schizophrenic or you know, split personality. On the one hand, it's a major center for tourism. And this is something that will change things. Jewish tourism, Polish tourism. So if you go to Lviv, I don't know if you've ever been there, Rob. Many times, there, yeah. yeah. Okay, so you know it's a city of cafes, jazz musicians. Habsburg you know, architecture, yeah. Habsburg architecture, signs in Polish in the restaurants, you know. That probably, I would say, is going to be a more erosive factor than simply studying the, the facts of the Holocaust, which, right. which, which has been a, a, a topic not to be discussed since 19... 19- 44. Mm. I you mean, know? you raise an interesting point, Professor. I think, you know, and this has also come up again in the series, which is, you know, this how to fight back piece. We perhaps overplay the role of academics and uh, historical studies in this process. I mean, naturally, we have a bias for that, given this is what we do. But, and this is, I suppose, the point about civil society, what that means takes many different forms. And some of it may even be banal, as banal as commercial activity, tourist activity. I suppose, to summarize your point. Yeah, I'll give you an example of my, my cousin, nephew, you know, one of those relations you have in Ukraine. So he is a very big boss in the IT business in Ukraine. And when the war broke out between Donbass and the Russian supporters of it and Ukraine, his view was that fighting over territory makes no sense. Ukraine shouldn't fight over territory. Everything is global now. Okay, where did he come from that? Not because anybody told him. He's just thinking. He's seeing a different world. The more people are exposed, the more people travel to different countries, the more people understand, I think, different ways of life and different attitudes, the more I feel they will grow to a normal understanding of the Holocaust. To my mind, the Holocaust should be part of history. And history should be part of a general person's education. It should not be something that is instrumentalized to defend a state or to denigrate a state. 
you know, we see that all the time. I personally, I look at all these people who died. I studied how so many of these people died. And I think, and the same is true, by the way, of the famine. This is not politics. This is people's tragedies. Move for the future. You know, there's nothing I can do about, nothing I can do. about, let's say, the way indigenous people were treated in Canada and reduced to poverty and blessed with all the social problems. But I can see the steps that led to it of these, of these people. It makes me sad. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's hard to disagree, Professor. And I think as well, you know, one, one hesitates to use too many labels, but a kind of broader humanist perspective that maybe, you know, as, as, as historians, we always, well, we tend to use the 19th century lens, 20th century lens of nationalism, but a broader humanist perspective perhaps reacts differently to these questions. And, and I would like to think I, I have the same perspective as you. I mean, I, I think what I'm interested in here or we're interested in, in this series is, again, it's the instrumentalization of things which perhaps shouldn't be instrumentalized. And I also mean in terms of, say, browbeating a nation because of what's happened in the past. There is, There was obviously a very structured project of Vergangenheitsbewältigung in Germany, which actually allowed Germany to move on. And so this wasn't actually trying to punish Germany so much as actually allow them to move on from this past and not have the great-grandchildren of perpetrators endlessly pay the price. And I think what we might be seeing in East Central Europe a little bit is this continued obsession with rights and wrongs and maybe over-defensiveness of the national position means an inability to move on on a human level and an inability to draw the line under things which actually were now several generations ago, at least three perhaps generations past. So I obviously agree with you 100% on a human level. I think it's sad both obviously from the Jewish perspective, from the loss, in point of view of the loss, but also from the Ukrainian perspective, equally from the Polish perspective, their losses, their struggle, which remains a kind of narrative of loss and invasion and so on too. And to draw a line under it is very difficult when we keep having these narratives instrumentalized or silenced rather than finding a kind of middle human ground in all these discussions. It's always very difficult to find the middle ground in whatever we talk about. We find this in the UK with Brexit now as well. It sort of ended up polarizing people and continues to do so. But thank you for those reflections, uh, very moving reflections, and it's hard to disagree. I think in terms of, again, where we're going in this podcast, it's no secret we're programmatic here. We do believe in such a thing as a liberal project. This is why we have this title. We do believe in civil society and we believe in scrutinizing these processes in order to move on from them, to deconstruct them and hopefully allow society to, to kind of build a positive project beyond a kind of unhealthy obsession with repression or uh, perhaps um, sanitizing areas of history. I just wonder, Professor, whether you had any thoughts on the present time and perhaps the last year in particular with the pandemic, have you seen any changes in sort of Ukrainian politics? Do you think the pandemic has maybe instrumentalized history again in a different way? We have seen in Poland that again, the kind of, this kind of illiberal trend has increased in recent months, sometimes using the pandemic as an excuse. Is there a similar process in Ukraine or do things look I different? Have, I haven't observed it. I haven't observed it in anything I read. You don't have a like where I live, there are the anti-maskers used to be very powerful, but now everybody can can go without a mask in our province. But mm -hmm. I didn't see that in Ukraine. In general, I would say the current president has de-emphasized the kind of historical politics. He himself, as you, you might know, is Jewish, but I don't think that, you know, trying to take people's attitudes and say, well, he's a Jew ergo is helpful at all. But he came in on a program that was stood apart from the history wars. And he, he um, dismissed the previous history commissar, uh, Volodymyr Vyotrovich, and replaced him with Anton Drobovich, who is more analytical, more scholarly. The Ukrainian Institute of National Remembrance doesn't have the same authority and power that it had under the Poroshenko presidency, where it initiated legislation on the municipal and federal and the, you know state level 
there are still people in that institute who are very much gung-ho pro-nationalists, but it's toned down. What you have instead in Ukraine is less kind of on the top uh, nationalism in Ukraine or illiberalism in Ukraine, but a lot of illiberalism coming within the population. So you have, oh, just for instance, recently Christian communities and some government officials were removing books from ivano Frankivsk libraries, children's books that had, it's called Princess Plus Princess. And it's a story about two girls who get married. And that's being removed from the library. But generally speaking, Ukraine tries to give the appearance of a more liberal society. So just a couple of years ago, I think there were about a thousand or 2000 marchers in a gay pride parade in Kiev and 5,000 policemen assigned to guard them from the local population. And, you know, Holocaust vandalism is monitored and um, Ukraine in its official capacity does try to emulate a liberal society. But every once in a while, Israel or, or Poland will call them out and say, but then why are you glorifying ethnic cleansers and Holocaust perpetrators? But that's a momentary embarrassment. Poland is certainly not going to declare war on Ukraine for this. So I think that um, with that kind of official facade, it's not, it's not like Hungary or, or Poland in that way. You know, the church opposes abortions, but the state stays clear of it. Just to interject... This being said, what about election results as a form of fake news? Isn't this a particular challenge in Ukraine? You know, votes there can, can, can reflect who's counting much more than elsewhere. I see. So perhaps not free and fair by a, a broadly Western definition. There have been votes where you can see where 100% of people turned out to vote. Within, the, okay. within the, the, the context. Less and less than that now. But I would say the gerrymandering is not the major tactic. However, that's an, a very interesting and very complex picture that you've painted, Professor. Obviously, there's the East-West dynamic that those with even the tiniest amount of knowledge of Ukraine in the West would know about, obviously because of the Russian element too, which I wanted to ask you about just briefly as we close. And namely, in terms of whether this is also affecting uh, political discussion in Ukraine, whether it has an impact on the political course. It sounds like from the picture you've painted, as I say, it's complex. There are a lot of liberal trends in Ukrainian society, perhaps even more than currently in Hungary and Poland, at least on a kind of social level, perhaps not at the political level. But I just wondered how this Russia discussion might affect, affect things or be affecting things, given it is in effect a, a live or a frozen war. Well, the problem is, uh, as I see it, is that the largely Russophone population of Ukraine absorbs a lot of media from Russia. And that's kind of post-Soviet message. If you consider Putin illiberal, which I certainly do, then there are many people who think he's okay in that, you know, where there's a strong Russian and Russophone population, there's a group of people who feel that's not just okay, it's, it's the way to go forward. So it's a different kind of illiberalism. You know, the nationalists, they're all over Ukraine, but they're concentrated in the West. Pro-Putin type forces, they're all over Ukraine, but they're mainly in the East and South. So there's that kind of double whammy. And it's as those societies change in the East, that I think will we'll move towards a, a truly more emancipated, more liberal, more enlightenment kind of uh, mentality. But it is hard with the messaging coming out of Russia. Russia has been supporting illiberal politics in America, throughout Europe. I will refrain from giving my thoughts on the Middle East. But, you know, that's, and they've got a large audience in Ukraine. This is just a fact. It's just like I live in Canada. I speak English, not a French. Well, I guess I do watch some American news. I read Reuters and, and stuff like that. My wife, she's constantly following American politics. That's what Canadians do. Same thing, you're living in Kharkiv. You know, you're following what uh, the Russian news, news is saying. So it's a double whammy of illiberalism spreading in the society, 
very conservative Christianity. Uh, Russian Orthodoxy is still the largest, well, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarch is still the largest confession in Ukraine. Followed by, you know, there's also the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. These are very conservative institutions. They're, you know, they take positions which are very common to like the same as the Council of Catholic Bishops in America, where you know, you decide about abortion and same-sex marriages and so forth as the issues. So there's a, there's a lot to work on in Ukraine. Absolutely. But what seems interesting from the, again, returning to particularly this subject in this podcast, in terms of history, you're perhaps, and, I, and again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but there is certainly a glimmer of hope in terms of the fact that these instrumentalizations of history have only clearly had limited success, firstly. Secondly, we've talked about the grassroots elements coming through and maybe making a material difference in years to come. And thirdly, the fact that Ukraine has other concerns and in its heterogeneous nature that you've just sketched, some of it is extremely liberal by a kind of broad social definition. So we have a really interesting picture here, Professor. I think, that, please tell me, of course, if my characterization is slightly wrong of what you said, but um, I think in terms of this podcast subject, we can we can actually see some hope here. Yes, I, to quote the old days, right? The Austrian Empire was supposed to be hopeless, but not serious. Problems in Ukraine are serious, but not hopeless. And that's a great note to end on. Professor, huge thanks, very warm thanks for your time, for your engagement, every success with your book, which we will all Thank look you. forward to. Thank you very much.